Welcome to this presentation on Chapter 10. Today we're going to discuss remedies that are available under contract law. Let's begin. So we're going to first of all need to separate uh, the remedies that are available into two different buckets. All the remedies that we're going to talk about today go either into the legal remedies bucket or the equitables rem equitable remedies bucket, sorry about that. Um, it's an important distinction, and so when you're going through and preparing yourself for quizzes and tests, make sure that you know, hey, this is a legal remedy or this is an equitable remedy. Um, it's an either-or situation. A remedy can't be both, and it can't be neither. It's got to be one or the other. So keep that distinction in mind, and as we're going through each one, we're going to cover the legal remedies first. We'll do all of those that we're going to cover today, and then we'll also cover the equitable remedies, and that will be all grouped together as well. So note that organization as we go through these uh, various items. Uh, but before we start, let's talk about some key vocabulary terms. And the first one we want to talk about is the idea of remedies. When I hear the term remedy in everyday conversation, I think of something medical related. You know, a remedy for a, a bad back might be a heating pad, or the remedy for a toothache uh, might be to get a, a new filling or a remedy for um, a migraine might be an ibuprofen or something along those lines. It's a, a term for a cure. And that's a very analogous idea to what we see in contract law. A remedy that we would have, whether it be a legal remedy or an equitable remedy, is kind of the cure for whatever the problem is that the plaintiff is experiencing. You know, when a plaintiff files a lawsuit, he or she isn't doing it because he or she is bored. <laughs> um, he or she is doing it to accomplish a specific thing or sometimes more than one thing. And usually what he or she is trying to accomplish is to get a certain remedy. It's the reason you go to the dentist when you have a toothache. You want him or her to give you some kind of treatment that's going to make that toothache go away. And when you have a, an ear ache and you go to the doctor, well, you aren't interested in him, you know, examining your elbow. He you want him or her to evaluate your ear and to see um, how to cure that problem. Well, the same way with the plaintiff when he or she files a lawsuit. He or she is seeking a, one or more remedies. Now, just because he or she is seeking it doesn't mean he or she's going to get the remedy that, that is being sought, but at least that's the goal of the particular um, item. Another term for this, of course, is damages, and that might be the more common term. But this is looking, you know, the term damages means the same thing, but it's looking at the whole situation from a very different point of view. When we think about remedy, we think about cure or treatment or solution. I'm just going to write the word solution. It solves the plaintiff's problems. When we see the term damages, we're focusing not upon the solution, but upon the problem. So when we talk about damages, we're looking at, well, what kind of harm has the plaintiff experienced as a result of whatever happened? And that's what we're thinking about in damages. And we talk about remedy, we're saying, well, what's going to solve the problem that has been created by these damages? So uh, in a way, they're synonyms and they mean the same thing, but in a way, they're polar opposites. Uh, but in the law, we usually think about it. at the end of the day, they end up being the same amount, usually a dollar amount. And so you can see them as interchangeable, just as long as you keep in mind that Theoretically, they have a different context. So let's look at the formal definition. The way a right is enforced by a court of law when injury, harm, or wrongful act is imposed upon another person. And of course, who is this other person? Well, it's the plaintiff, right? That's who we're talking about. Okay, and we've already determined that there are two types of remedies. We have legal remedies and we have equitable remedies. Well, how do you tell a legal remedy from an equitable remedy? It's pretty obvious conceptually, but it can get a little bit murky in the details, in the weeds. When the plaintiff is seeking money, dollars, he or she is seeking a legal remedy. When he is seeking something other than money, in other words, dollar bills isn't going to solve the problem, he or she is seeking an equitable remedy. That's the rule. 
and that is true. But there are a few equitable remedies that end up being dollar amounts. And so it can get a little bit tricky in the weeds. Uh, but legal remedies are always going to be reduced to dollars and cents. You'd never have a legal remedy that is something other than money. An equitable remedy usually won't be money, but sometimes it can work out that it ends up being money. So we'll look at those distinctions in a little bit more detail. Now that's not the only difference between legal and equitable remedies. Uh, my guess is that if, you, if this isn't your first course in the paralegal program, you've heard a presentation on the differences between legal remedies and equitable remedies. And I'm not going to, so therefore I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through what's a legal remedy, what's an equitable remedy. But I will put it in a bit of context just to have, so you can have a little bit of a refresher. Uh, back in the 1700s, even into the 1800s, um, we in, in Great Britain and also to some extent the United States had two court systems. We had a court at law, and as you can imagine, a court at law is focused upon you know, legal remedies. And then there were chancery courts, which were focused upon equitable remedies. And the plaintiff had to choose, well, do I file my claim in a court of law, in other words, to seek money, or should I file it in a chancery court because I want something other than money? The plaintiff had to pick and had to say, which is the better path for me? He couldn't file it in both places. He had to pick one. And there were a lot of strategic decisions that he or she had to make to decide what was the best place. Uh, some of it had to do with um, the nature of the claim, um, his particular circumstances, what he had done with respect to the events, um, and what he wanted to accomplish in, in this particular lawsuit, what he wanted out of it. And so he would make a choice, and uh, whichever one he picked would be the court that he would file in, in. And if it ended up that he chose poorly, and it ended up that he didn't get everything that he wanted in the one court, he didn't get a second bite of the apple. He couldn't go and say, oh, I'm sorry, court at law thing didn't work out for me. I'm not going to file in chancery court, or vice versa. No, once he chose a path, all the other doors were closed, and he was just out of luck. So it was an important decision for him to make. But, you know, sometimes plaintiffs want both legal remedies and equitable remedies. In fact, I would say uh, usually a plaintiff wants as many remedies as he or she can, can justify legally, right? I mean, why would you want less? Why wouldn't you want more? That's just kind of the nature of the human, human experience. And so nowadays in a lawsuit, it's very common to see that a plaintiff seeks both legal remedies and equitable remedies. Almost always legal remedies, but not infrequently equitable remedies as well. And so uh, the plaintiff today would say, why should I have to choose? Why can't I try both? And that's actually what, how the law currently is. Um, usually the plaintiff doesn't have to choose. The plaintiff can sue for legal remedies and equitable remedies at the same time. That's a very common path. What happened in the 1800s is that the two legal systems began to merge. And so instead of having the two courthouses or the two courtrooms, you'd have just one. And that particular judge would act as a judge at a court of law and also as a chancery court. He or she would perform both functions and had the, the power to, remit, to uh, provide legal remedies and equitable remedies. And as you can see, that's a good situation for a plaintiff because two things. Plaintiff no longer has to choose, and, and so he's insulated from making a bad choice by choosing the wrong courthouse. Plus, he gets to take advantage of both systems. So in the old system, even if he chose well and he picked the, the smartest court for him, it still might be he wouldn't have gotten as much as if he could have filed in both of those. But now he gets that opportunity, so it's a, a better situation for the, um, the plaintiff. So how about our system in Texas? Well, um, as you know, we became a first a, a nation, a republic, and then we became a state. And when we became a republic, prior to that time, we had been a part of Mexico. And of course, Mexico was a civil code jurisdiction. So these ideas of law and equity wouldn't have resonated exactly in the same way as, as they would in a common law jurisdiction. Uh, once uh, Mex excuse me, Texas became independent of Mexico, um, the majority of the citizens were from 
former common law jurisdictions, other U.S. states, in other words. And so they decided, well, let's replace this civil code system with a common law system. Now, they didn't throw everything out of the civil code system. There are still remnants in our legal system today of our ties with Mexico and Spain and France and all that good stuff. But at least in this area, um, our found, Texas founding fathers and mothers decided to revert to a, a common law system. And this was about the time that jurisdictions were consolidating. They were moving to having the one courthouse, uh, the court system in which the judge would administer both legal and equitable remedies. And so we were a bit ahead of the curve. We looked at the, at the, the progress of, of these systems and said, wait a second, why develop two when the trend is to consolidate into one? And so in Texas, we never actually had chancery courts. We never actually had courts that just provided equitable relief. From day one, when we became a republic, our courts provided legal remedies and equitable remedies. Um, but that distinction is still important because um, we'll see, well, actually, we, I probably won't go into much detail, but it, it's not, the, the, the reason that we care about the distinction between legal and equitable remedies isn't just historic. There are important distinctions to this day between the systems. And even though the same judge can award legal remedies and equitable remedies, that judge has to make independent evaluations of circumstances. And so an, indi an individual judge might say, yes, plaintiff, you are eligible for legal remedies, but no plaintiff, you aren't eligible for these equitable remedies. So it's not just an on switch. Well, you know, if you're eligible for one, you're eligible for them all. No, the judge is going to make separate findings. And so there can well be cases in which a plaintiff is successful at recovering legal remedies, but not successful at, re at recovering equitable remedies. Um, I suppose the reverse could be true, although that would be unusual. Usually the legal remedies are much more e easily obtained um, in a court of court than you'd find um, equitable remedies. And that the reason for that distinction we find right here. Equitable remedies are awarded when no suitable monetary remedies exist. The presumption in the law is that money solves virtually every problem, at least every legal problem. Maybe it doesn't solve your love life problems, uh, but uh, it, it solves your legal problems. Usually what plaintiffs want is money. Um, they may have preferred not to have needed an attorney or needed to file a lawsuit at all, but now that they're in the thick of this lawsuit, what they want is money. They don't want other stuff that much. They really just want the money. That's about 90, maybe even 95% of what they want. And that's what our court system is designed to provide. Providing stuff other than money is hard for our system. Um, there are lots of reasons that it is hard that are kind of beyond the, the scope of this class, but generally speaking, a judge will, will allow a jury to award money quite readily, but solutions other than money, a judge is going to require evidence that money isn't going to completely solve the problem. And even then, even when the plaintiff is able to establish, wait a second, your Honor, money doesn't solve this problem for X, Y, Z reason. And even when the judge says, you're right, it won't. The judge is still free to say, tough, you're not going to get what you want for X, Y, Z reason. So sometimes, even when the legal remedy isn't an adequate fix, the court can still deny an equitable remedy. So it's a, a little bit of a different uh, twist on things. Um, there's a lot more discretion on the part of the judge when the judge is sitting in equity. So here we have a list of six fairly common legal contract remedies. There's a couple of things I'd like to say about these types of remedies, and I have them listed here as damages, but for the purposes of our uh, presentation, consider the terms to be basically synonyms of each other. A um, couple of things to say. First of all, if we were to have, you know, 50 contracts textbook, probably there'd be, gee whiz, at least 10 different ways of talking about contract, uh, legal contract remedies. There's lots of different ways of dividing up that pie. Let me just put a little picture here, maybe. Okay, imagine that you're coming to my house for Thanksgiving. 
Um, it's just you and me. We're it. And I have baked a pecan pie. Well, guess what? I can just cut it in half, and here's your piece, and here's my piece. Awesome, right? But most of the time when people are having Thanksgiving dinner, they have more than two people. And let's say it's not just you, but you are also bringing your mom and dad and your significant other. And I'm there with my husband and my two children. So you have four people, and I have four people. So we need eight pieces. Now, we have a piece of pie here. Here's yours. Here's your significant others. Here's your mom's. Here's your dad's. Here's mine, here's my husband's, here's my daughter's, and here's my son's. So now we're covered. Everybody's gotten a piece of pie. The pie itself is the same size, but obviously each one of the pieces are smaller. So this is a more granular breakdown of the pie, so to speak. Um, we have the same amount of pie, we're just dividing it up into smaller pieces. Our textbook does that. Our textbook breaks down the world of damages into six different, legal damages into six different pieces. That's fairly granular. And so um, it, it's broken down more than you'll see in, in other textbooks. It's not wrong. It's not right. It's just one way of looking at it. Uh, this isn't wrong when you only have two people coming to cut the pie in half. It isn't wrong to cut it up into eight pieces if you have eight people coming. But I don't want you to think, ah, oh, this is the only way of looking at the pie that is legal contract remedies. This is the one we'll be using in this textbook, but it's not an inevitable way of breaking up the pie. Um, this one has six pieces, but you can imagine pies with, with other pieces. So if we're going to think about it this way, we have, you know, this is our six piece pie, um, each one of these being a slice. But we could have divided it up in different ways, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to talk about this first one, compensatory damages. And you can see at the beginning of the word compensatory, we have the word or the beginning of the word compensate or compensation. Um, that's a key word when we're looking at compensatory damages. Compensatory damages are damages recoverable in a lawsuit for loss of injury suffered by the plaintiff as a result of the, of the defendant's actions. It's designed to compensate the plaintiff. Um, it's also designed to put the plaintiff in the same position he or she would have been in if the contract had been fully performed. So it's um, designed to put the plaintiff in the position he or she would have been in if the defendant had done what he or she was supposed to do. The way to calculate this is usually going to be along this line. We look at the cost of the substituted performance of the non-breach party incurred due to the breach. So here when we say non-breaching party, who do we mean? We mean the plaintiff. So what did the plaintiff have to do? Um, what, what was the cost he incurred? compared to what he would have paid under the terms of the contract and that difference. And that is what we see as the compensation. This is the most important category for legal remedies and it's actually probably the most important category even if we lump together equitable remedies. This is where most of the damages are going to be. This is the most common category of damages and it is also usually the largest amount of damages and so you'll see compensatory damages no matter how people divide up the pie that is legal legal remedies they're going to have compensatory damages in the mix um, now we're going to talk about consequential damages Consequential damages are the indirect damages. They aren't, so if we were to compare this to the compensatory damages, we would say that these are more direct damages. Defendant breaches, ergo, 
plaintiff is going to have to incur this um, expense that is greater than what he would have incurred if the defendant had complied with the contract. So these are things that happen, but they are a little bit more attenuated from the event. And we'll go through e examples of this in a few minutes, but I just want to kind of go through the definitions before we uh, uh, go any deeper into the topic. Okay, so um, these are indirect damages, damages that do not result from the wrongful act itself, but from the result or the aftermath of the wrongful act. Um, but it's also important that they be foreseeable. So sometimes there are, con and you can see under the word consequential, you see the beginning of the word consequence. What is a consequence? Well, we all know what a consequence is. It's what happens as a result of if A, then B. If it snows, the roads are going to, if it you know, snows, the roads are going to be icy. You know, that's a consequence of the snow. And so um, in order to have consequential damages, though, there has to be a foreseeability factor. So there has to be a logical connection. Imagine for a second that you and I enter into a contract and you're supposed to supply me with widgets. Um, and you're supposed to supply them to me by uh, August 1st. Uh, that's our contract and you're supposed to supply me with a thousand widgets and I'm going to pay you ten thousand dollars. Well you don't you don't really know what I'm going to do with it. I didn't really share with you my business plan. You don't supply them on August 1st. You don't supply them on the 2nd, the 3rd, the 4th, or the 5th. As a result of you not supplying it, I can't complete my toasters. And I was in a contract with Walmart. And as a result of me not being able to complete my toasters, I breached my contract with Walmart. Well, the clause in my contract with Walmart means that because I breached, I'm going to lose that whole contract. Well, Walmart was 80% of my customer base. And as a result of this, um, I'm out of business. I'm not going to be able to continue with my toaster company at this point. Was it reasonable to think that because you were five days late with your delivery of your widgets that my whole business would go bankrupt? Well, probably not. It probably wasn't a foreseeable consequence unless I gave you information that told you about that or that information was generally available out in this industry. So sometimes there can be consequences that aren't foreseeable. Let me give you another example of foreseeable. Let's say that um, you breach your contract. You're supposed to deliver those widgets on August 1st. You don't. Second, third, fourth, fifth comes. You haven't delivered it. So I decide I'm going to go and, and see my competitor or your competitor, see if I can get widgets from him. So I do. I am able to persuade him to sell me widgets for eleven dollars um, per widget. So it's going to be eleven thousand dollars instead of ten, but still I need the widget, so it's not not too bad of a deal. So I send my big my big uh, semi over there to pick up these widgets, um, and I end up doing that on August six. Well, it happens that on August six there is a freak storm that arises with really uh, tornado-like winds and my semi is swept off the road. Um, all of the widgets go down into the water, let's say it's swept off the road uh, into the lake, and my semi is destroyed. Um, so uh, I am now uh, don't have any widgets. I've spent $11,000 and my truck that was worth you know $100,000 is now destroyed. Well, if you had supplied the widgets on August 1st as you were supposed to, um, I would not have incurred any of those losses. Um, but uh, is that really foreseeable that if you breach that somehow or another that's going to cause my truck to go off of the bridge? Uh, that doesn't seem very foreseeable. And in fact, that type of damage seems speculative. What is a speculative damage? It's damages that have yet to occur um, or have occurred, but uh, that they're, they, it, it's, it's not likely that they're going to occur. I mean, they may ultimately do occur, but a person could not have anticipated that. Uh, it wasn't foreseeable. So the court would allow me uh, to, to collect foreseeable damages 
for example, the difference between the $10 a widget price versus $11 widget price. That's foreseeable that I'm going to have to pay more because I'm having to enter into a last minute contract. But I think the court would say it wasn't foreseeable that when I actually pick up those $11 a widget widgets that I would lose my truck and my whole inventory. So you can see how some would be speculative and some would be consequential, depending upon the likelihood of those events happening. And part of this goes back to what does the plaintiff, what type of information does the plaintiff share with the defendant? The story that I provided about the Walmart transaction, um, th the specifics about that could be considered speculative, especially if I hadn't shared it with you. On the other hand, if I did share it with you, hey, it's really important that I get these widgets by August 1st and not a day later because I have to satisfy the terms of my contract with Walmart. Well, once you know that, obviously it's not speculative. You knew it, it was foreseeable, so it could be a consequential damage. So it is to the advantage of the plaintiff to let the defendant, or let, and I would say at this point, you're not plaintiff and defendant, you're just two parties contracting. Um, but it does make sense to have your uh, your other party to the contract be aware of kind of why you want the things you want um, why it's important that you get things soon or why it's important you have particular features um, sometimes you might not want to share them maybe it's part of your business model but it, generally speaking it's a good idea um, to share information in, and to remove to move um, damages from speculative to consequential Okay, so let's go on and talk about incidental damages. Incidental damages, as you probably can see from the title, starts with the word incident, right? Uh, but more importantly, when we hear the word incidental, we probably think minor, trivial. Oh, that's an incidental point. Not, not a major point. I mean, it's maybe valid, but it's not the big deal. Well, that's what we're talking about with incidental damages. Usually, incidental damages are a relatively small portion of the overall damages, but they're not unusual to have, it's not unusual to have some incidental damages. Um, so, technically, the definition is expenses that the non breaching party, again, we're talking plaintiff here, incurred related to the breach, off breach <laughs> often expended to, further, to exploit further loss out-of-pocket expenses of the plaintiff. So examples of these might be expenses reasonably occurred in inspection, receipt, transportation, and care of goods rightfully rejected due to breach, um, any commercially reasonable charges related to the breach, expenses or commissions in connection with affecting the cover, and we'll talk about cover um, later on in a different chapter, um, but uh, basically this is a working definition of what cover is right here. Uh, the, act, the cover is the action of purchasing the goods elsewhere when the seller breaches. Any other reasonable expense incident to the purchase uh, to the breach. So going back to my example where you breached and you were supposed to deliver those widgets on August 1st. Well, I'm scrambling to try to find somebody else who can provide the, the widget. So I might be uh, placing telephone calls. I might be sending faxes. I might be... Um, traveling to various locations. Hey, what are the features of your widgets? What are the prices? All that stuff. Well, all of the expenses associated with that, travel, communication, things along those lines, maybe attorney's fees, all of that would be an incidental expense. Are those expenses going to be as great as the compensatory damages? Almost certainly not. That would be very unusual. They may not even be as great as the consequential damages, although there aren't always consequential damage. Some many times there are there isn't consequential damage. But when they are, they're probably going to be greater than incidental damages. But if you're a plaintiff, you're figuring to yourself, well, okay, my incidental damages aren't huge, but I'd like to get them. I mean, I'd, I'd rather have more rather than less. So incidental damages are definitely something that you can recover. Let's go through a scenario and figure out um, how to look at these particular cases. So we have a contract. The two parties to our contract are A and B. We'll call them Al and Bob. So Al agrees to supply 500 widgets to Bob on January 1st for the purchase of, for the price of $10 per widget. So this means that Bob is supposed to pay, um, $5,000, right? That's his job. 
and A is supposed to provide 500 widgets. In this scenario, A breaches, so he does not provide 500 widgets to B on January 1st. Well, what happens as a result of A breaching? Well, B has to close his factory for four days due to the lack of widgets, and that costs him $4,000. So now we're trying to decide which category we've, we have uh, that these go into. So we have, let's just list our choices. We have compensatory, I'm going to abbreviate it with comp, consequential, and we have incidental. Okay, um, this sounds like a consequential damage. So we're going to put this right here. Let's go back and look at our definition to see how that plays out. Indirect losses, damages that do not result from the wrongful act itself, but from the result of the aftermath of the wrongful act. Was it inevitable that when A breaches that B was going to have to close its factory? Not necessarily. Maybe B had a, a, an inventory of 30 days back supply of widgets, or maybe uh, B uh, could run other items on his uh, throughout his factory that don't require those widgets. Maybe he has several product lines and only some require widgets. It wasn't inevitable that he was going to have to close his factory as a result of A breaching. But it is a consequence. I mean, if A had provided the 500 widgets on time as he was supposed to, B wouldn't have had to close his factory and he wouldn't have incurred the cost of $4,000. So it's clearly a consequence, but it's not an inevitable consequence. Let's go to the next item. B, so B's had to close his factory. B negotiates with three other suppliers, Connie, David, and Elmer. And they all have widget factories. So he's trying to figure out, hey, where can I get my best widget deal now that Al has let me down? Um, B has had to make several trips to their offices to negotiate. And the cost of all this, this transportation, maybe he's had to get a, an Uber, or maybe he's uh, had gas money, um, whatever the reason for the expenses are, it's $132. Well, this sounds like an incidental uh, situation. If it's an expense, usually going to fall under the incidental category. Bob, okay, so Bob chooses Connie. To, so he, ha, he has to pay Connie to supply the widgets at a price of $12 per widget. So instead of $10 per widget, it's $12 per widget. So let's just do the math. So we have $500. I'm saying 500 widgets times $12. Sorry about that. So that is 1000 and 5,000. So it's a total of $6,000 that he's going, that Bob is going to have to pay C. But he was only going to have to pay A $5,000. So we're talking about that difference. Let's go back to our equation here. The cost of the substituted performance that the non-breaching party incurred due to the breach, so this is the contract with C involving $6,000 minus the actual price of the contract, which would have been $5,000 if Al had done what he was supposed to. So it's the difference between those two. In this particular case, it would be $1,000. So this is a compensatory damage. So it's $1,000 and it's compensatory. So this is the breakdown from our scenario. Okay, so let's go on and talk about, uh, so these are the three big ones. And you can see in terms of importance, and size, we're getting less and less important. Smaller amounts. Well, now we're going to get really small with nominal damages. If 
you've ever taken French, you know that nom means name in French. Um, and that's a kind of a logical connection that you might make between nominal damages um, and that French word because they are damages in name only. They aren't material. They aren't significant actual sums of money. Uh, they're symbolic sums. So what, what's the definition that we have here for nominal damages? Damages awarded to a plaintiff in a very small or merely symbolic amount. Okay. What's the, the purpose of nominal damages is to acknowledge that the plaintiff was messed up, that the plaintiff behaved himself and the defendant didn't. And in this particular case, everything worked out okay for the plaintiff, so the plaintiff really doesn't get any money, but still he was wronged. And the court system says, you know what? We want to communicate to you that you were wronged. And so we're going to give you a symbolic type of, of damages. It might be a dollar, it might be ten dollars, but it's going to be a very, very um, small amount. So let's go back, let's change the scenario so we can see what nominal damages might have looked like. Okay, so this, the first two facts remains the same, but in this case, B has a 30-day inventory of widgets, so he doesn't have to close his factory. B negotiates with C, D, and E all over the phone, uh, so there's no expense associated with it. So this ends up being zero. And it ends up that C just had one of its customers back out, and it actually is willing to supply the 500 widgets to B for $9 a widget. So instead of paying the $5,000, B is only going to pay $4,500. So actually, B's $500 ahead of the game. B is actually making a quote unquote profit on off of A's breach. Um, so certainly if, if B were to sue A, B is not going to be able to prove any damages, but still the fact remains that in that A didn't know that was going to be the outcome. When A breached, um, it could not have anticipated all of the, uh, you know, the things were going to play out just right. And so B definitely was wronged, even though he did not actually suffer a monetary loss or perhaps even experienced a profit. So uh, B, Bob, in this case, can still sue um, and possibly can be awarded nominal damages. Now, many courts won't award a nominal damages and almost never do plaintiffs sue just to get nominal damages. Usually they're hoping to be able to persuade the court or the jury that they have real damages, that they have compensatory or consequential or incidental damages, or some way of looking at damages. And so when they get awarded nominal damages instead, it's not that they're saying, yippee, I got nominal damages. No, I mean, they're bound, they're like, oh my gosh, that's all I got was nominal damages. Um, they were hoping for more, in other words, but nominal damages is better than nothing, and so they usually take it. So we've covered the first four. Now we're going to talk about, the, so th these first three are the main ones. This one is instead of these. You only get nominal damages if all of these are zero. If this is zero, and this is zero, and this is zero. These last two are kind of in the same category as nominal damages. These are squirrely, these are weird, these are unusual. We don't usually see, well actually this one's not, this one's quite common, very common. Um, but it's, it doesn't play by the normal rules that we've already talked about. Um, the other two are unusual situations. Uh, and, and the nominal damages situation isn't factually unusual, but it's unusual to actually result in a lawsuit because after all, why would you sue unless you lost money? Most people, unless you're really litigious or really kind of a jerk, isn't going to sue if they didn't lose money on a transaction. And usually they're not going to sue unless they lost a significant amount of money. Okay, so we've talked about nominal damage. Let's go on and talk about liquidated damages. This is a super cool one. And this is, uh, I guess, a takeaway, um, a, a way to look at this issue to be proactive. As we talk about contract law, we are usually focusing upon something going wrong. Um, you know, usually the story goes, there's a contract and then somebody breached. Um, as we 
as we go through kind of our, our professional lives, though, we'll discover most of the time people do what they're supposed to do. Most of the time people don't breach. Um, you know, 95 or more percent of the time, A will provide the widgets and B will pay for the widgets. Um, if B didn't want to pay for it, he wouldn't have entered into the contract. If A wasn't going to supply the widgets, he wouldn't have entered into the contract. Some things can go wrong, but those are unusual scenarios. Most of the time, people do what they're supposed to. One of the reasons that they do what they're supposed to is because they're concerned about having to pay damages. And so these damages that we've been talking about at this point are actually designed in some sense to be motivators. Okay, don't don't goof off. Don't, don't not do what you're supposed to do because if you don't, then you're going to have to uh, pay these sums of money. Well, one approach that parties to a contract can do that can make life easier for both sides is to have a liquidated damages provision in the contract. This has two big advantages for the parties, probably more than two, but two obvious advantages. The first is that when you have, when we've, we've talked about before, we were talking about Al and Bob here, we went through two different scenarios. We went through the scenario where he has 4,000 in damages and 132 and 1,000. So he's a total of $5,132 worth of damages. And then we had another scenario where he earned $500 in profit. Uh, but in both scenarios, A did exactly the same thing. A's behavior was the same. But the outcome for A was very, very different. In one case, he had to pay over $5,000. In the other case, he maybe had to pay a buck or 10 bucks. Pretty significant difference. Um, and that level of differing outcomes causes there to be uncertainty in the transaction. And that uncertainty has several negative consequences. One negative consequence is that uh, when A is in a pickle, when a, a particular situation has arisen, let's say he has, he owes his customers, you know, 10,000 widgets on that particular day, but he only has 7,000 widgets. Uh, one of his machines is broken and he can't make any more. He'd love to make more, but he just can't. And so now he has to pick and choose who he's going to supply the widgets to. And so he's trying to think, well, do I give some to Bob? but not in need to Mary, or do I give them to Mary and not Teresa? How do I apportion the widgets that I have? And there can, of course, be lots of different issues or lots of different ways that he might look at it. He might think, well, you know, Bob is a really steady customer. If I shortchange him on the widgets, he might take his business to somebody else. Uh, Mary rarely orders widgets from me, so if I lose her business forever, it's not such a big, big point. So in other words, Al might be thinking about customer service and long-term kind of market issues. But he might also be thinking about damages. Well, what will Mary be able to successfully sue me for compared to Bob? Well, how will Al know that? Well, he might know all those specifics about the circumstance. For example, he might know information about Bob's and Mary's business to know whether Bob will have to close his factory. And if he does, it's going to cost him $4,000. Or will Mary have to close her factory? You know, maybe um, it's possible Al might know the inventory levels that Bob and Mary keep of widgets that might help him decide how to apportion the widgets. Um, or he might know how likely it is that Bob or Mary would be able to find widgets in the market and what price point they might be. And maybe Mary's factory is out in the country, farther away from widget factories. Bob's... Uh, a business is, is right around other widget factories, so he's going to be able to source them a lot easier. So those might influence which uh, company um, Al decides to uh, satisfy the contract for, and which uh, company Bob decide which which contract Bob decides to breach. But there's an easier way to approach this, and that is to, for the parties to actually put in the contract what the damages will be if there is a breach. And this is what we call a liquidated uh, provision in a contract. They're very, very common. Um, I would say that in, uh, in contracts for goods of this type, um, they would be, uh, it'd be foolish not to include uh, a liquidated damage clause. So what is it? 
Well, it's the sum of money specified in the contract that will be the total amount of compensation that an aggrieved party, again, read plaintiff, will, be, will get if the other party breaches one or more parts of the contract. Please note that this term isn't defined in the textbook, but you do need to know it, so flag this one. Um, you might even want to write it into your textbook so you'll have it all, all, that, all those terms in one central place. This is something that is negotiated between the parties. So going back to our example, when Bob is trying to think, let's assume that this is the, the circumstance, that Bob is going to have to close his factory for four, uh, for, four, for four days as a result of A's breach. Well, when a, Bob and Al are negotiating, Bob will say, well, gosh, it, I mean, I hope you don't breach, Al, because if you do, I'm going to have to close my factory for four days. That's going to cost me $4,000. And so I'm going to want to have a liquidated damages provision that will cover me in that area. But let's assume that Mary keeps a 90-day inventory of widgets. And so when Al and Mary are discussing their contract, Mary says, well, you know, I mean, I don't want you to breach, but... Um, I can go several weeks still having sufficient inventory even in the event of your breach so it's not going to have a huge impact upon my business well you can see in that situation Bob is going to want a much greater liquidated damage provision than Mary is going to want to have or going to need to have um, and so um, the, the, the contracts might be virtually identical, but when you get to liquidated damages, the amount of liquidated damages might be significantly different. And of course, that gives information to Al now, because Al knows, well, gee whiz, if I have to breach, better that I breach Mary's contract because I'll have a much smaller liquidated damage provision to pay than if I breach a Bob. So that's one of the big things that liquidated damages provisions let you know is, how risky is it to breach? And how much is it going to cost me? That's a big factor. That's factor one. Factor two flows from factor one. And that is when you have a liquidated damages clause, everybody knows what's going to happen. Well, I make this sound like this is a good thing. And it is a good thing for the for Al and Bob but it's a lousy thing for you and me legal professionals because it means that Al and Bob doesn't need us I mean they need us to draft the contracts but now that Al has breached they don't really need us at least not don't need a lot of us to resolve the issue because when Al breaches Bob says okay Al I wish you hadn't breached but you breached well let's look at our contract oh wait a second our contract says five thousand dollars liquidated damages so you need to give me $5,000. Al looks at the contract. He goes, yeah, you're right. I don't, don't really see a way around it. I wish I could see a way around it. I don't want to pay you $5,000, but I guess I have to. Uh, a, a tightly written liquidated damages clause is just that. It's tightly written. There's no two ways about it. It's not de really debatable. It's just what's going to happen. And so there's really no reason for Al to contest the lawsuit. Why would you spend attorney's fees to contest something that you know you're going to lose? It's just going to end up, you're going to end up paying the $5,000 eventually and paying the attorneys. Uh, better just to pay the, the amount itself. So liquidated damage clauses, uh, reduce litigation because the amount of damages is much more certain. This is a, a little, I don't want to say it's not known, but it's, a, it's sometimes people forget this fact. And that is the reason that litigation happens isn't so much because there's disputes between people, although you obviously have to have a dispute in order to have lawsuits, but it's it really requires two things. It requires some type of dispute between the people, and it requires that the two parties value the case in different ways. One person values it highly, one person values it lowly. If the two parties value at the same rate, why would you ever need to file a lawsuit? If Al and Bob agree, yep, I owe you $7,497.14. If they agree, then there's no need to get the judge involved there's no need to get a jury involved it's only when bob and al value it differently and al say oh no i don't know you that much and bob says oh yes you do that's when you get in front of a jury and a liquidated damages clause gets you out of that situation and as a result of that several things flow number one 
The disputes gets resolved really quickly. After all, court cases drag on for months or years. It um, causes there to be less legal expenses, so the attorneys and paralegals get paid less, which is very sad. I want to emphasize that to you, very, very sad. But um, not so sad for Al and Bob. And finally, and this is uh, sometimes an important thing, and that is Al and Bob can sometimes kind of preserve their relationship. Uh, once you sue somebody, it's pretty hard to be their best buddy. Um, there's hard feelings. Uh, litigation is inherently an unpleasant, adversarial, stressful situation. And if you go through that process, uh, you're not too likely to really want to see those people ever, ever, ever again. <laughs> But you know what? If you have a liquidated damages clause and you look at it, go, yeah, 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 you five thousand dollars. Here, here you go. Or I'll, I'll pay, pay it to you as soon as I can. But I acknowledge the debt. Um, it may be the case that you can maintain that relationship and continue on. So let's talk about. So I made liquidated damages provision sound like they're magical and awesome and wonderful things, and they are those things. They can present a couple of problems. I guess one problem is that the tightest written liquidated damages clause still has some vulnerabilities, and that is that even when it's tightly written, sometimes there can be a disagreement as to what happened. Al might say, I didn't breach, Bob breached. And so, yeah, there's a liquidated damages clause, and it says $5,000, but I didn't breach, so I don't owe it to you. That can be an issue. So even with a tightly written liquidated damages clause, there can be factual disputes sometimes. And another problem is Al might say, yeah, I did breach, and yeah, our provision says $5,000, but I think that the liquidated damages clause is punitive. It doesn't really reflect what the actual damages are for Bob. Now we have to pause here and, and go back and think about our scenario. Remember in our scenario, in one, one situation, Bob experienced $5,132 worth of damages. In the other scenario, he experienced zero amount of damages, in fact, made a little bit of a profit off of it. And of course, there's a hundred different permutations we could have with those same facts. And so whatever liquidated damage number we come up with, be it $5,000 or $2,000 or whatever, the odds that that actually worked out to be exactly the same amount as Bob's damages is pretty unlikely. I mean, if we decided on, say, 2,500, well, probably half the time Bob's damages are more than that, and about half the time his damages are less than that. And so let's say in the discovery process, this happens to be one of the times that Bob was lucky, and Bob was able to find Connie and get his, get his widgets for a lot less money, and he wasn't really, didn't have to close his factory. Uh, he thought he was going to, but it ended up that uh, Connie was able to deliver the widget super fast and everything worked out really, really well. And so Bob was only out, you know, $1,000. And so Al says, well, why should I have to pay Bob $1,200, I mean, excuse me, a, a $2,500 in damages when he was only out 1000 That da liquidated damage provision looks punitive. It's designed to punish me. It's not designed to reflect the actual damages Bob experienced. Well, Bob's response is going to be, wait a second, I didn't have a crystal ball. I didn't know what price Connie was going to be able to offer me widgets. And I didn't know that she was going to luck into having the inventory right there to send it to me so I didn't have to close my factory. I lucked out this time. But next time, instead of, you know, uh, I might have needed to pay $5,000 and I still would have just gotten $2,500. And so the, 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 uh, the intention of liquidated damages or, or, or the review of whether it's reasonable or not isn't what actually happened, but what were some reasonable scenarios? And is the liquidated damages clause uh, consistent with those? If it is, then the court's going to enforce it. If it is significantly off the mark, significantly higher, than what the actual damages likely would be, um, then the court uh, is not going to likely to, to enforce those damages. Okay, so that explains liquidated damages. Obviously, when you have liquidated damages, this replaces all of these others. So the uh, plaintiff doesn't get to assert liquidated damages and compensatory damages. 
liquidated damages and consequential damages, liquidated damages and incidental damages, liquidated damages and um, nominal damages. No, this is the only choice that he has. Now, of course, these all can overlap, so you can sue for all three of these. But you're going to have to, as a plaintiff, um, say, well, if there's a liquidated damages clause, you're either going to say, well, that's what I think I'm entitled to, or challenge the liquidated damages clause on some basis and say, I don't want that. I want these other goodies. So let's talk about punitive damages. Punitive damages have a, a, a few different names. We'll talk about three of them here. The first, of course, is punitive, and you can actually see in the word punitive the beginning of the word punish, right? Another term for it is exemplary damages, and you can see here we have the beginning of the word example. Um, again, this is actually the, the French exemple. Um, which means example in French. Uh, they spell a little bit differently, but it's, but again, it's basically the same word. So when you have exemplary damages, you're making an example of somebody. Uh, it's a little bit different focus. Uh, this is more upon emphasizing deterrence. The goal here is to deter versus punish. But let's think about, let's just go through an example so we can see. So imagine for a second, that Bill Gates uh, has uh, he has a problem. He likes to go around and randomly punch people in the nose. And he has so much money that even when he causes people some pretty significant injury, it's not a meaningful financial situation for him. I mean, even if he breaks their nose and they have to take a week off from work, uh, you know, maybe $10,000, $20,000. I mean, let's face it, Bill Gates has a lot of money, so he can punch a lot of people in the nose, and still, that's not going to negatively impact his financial situation. He's uh, still going to be a very wealthy man. But after a while, um, people start noticing, hey, Bill keeps on punching people randomly. We don't think this is a socially useful behavior for him to have. We think we ought to punish him and so the next time he, he punches somebody in the nose, that person sues him not just for compensatory damages and consequential damages and incidental damages. And of course, there's no contract about this, so we wouldn't have liquidated damages. This would be a tort situation. But the, 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 the plaintiff also says, I want to sue Bill for punitive damages. I want to punish him just like in, in a certain sense, that we punish a criminal defendant. We want to, build, uh, we see in a civil system, we can't send Bill to jail, but it's kind of the financial equivalent of that. Um, we want to punish him, um, and the idea is so that Bill will stop um, punching people in the nose. He will learn that there are bad consequences for it, and that will motivate him to discontinue that behavior. Okay, so that's one way of looking upon punitive damages, but we can also look upon it as exemplary damages. I mean, they're the same thing, but they're just two different names and they focus on different qualities. So let's imagine that Bill Gates is still going around punching people in the nose and he, he pays all of his damages. He has attorneys, you know, kind of falling behind, giving money out. Um, and, you know, his best friend Warren Buffett also has been noticing Bill running around punching people in the nose and Warren starts thinking, that looks like fun. I'm, I'm thinking about taking up that hobby as well. Um, and so he's noticed Bill doing it. Well, yeah, it doesn't seem like anything terrible happens to Bill, so I think I'll just start punching people in the nose. Except right before Warren starts punching people in the nose, Bill gets sued. And this time, he gets sued for all the usual stuff. He gets sued for compensatory damages, consequential damages, and intentional damage, excuse me, incidental damages. But he also gets sued for you know, exemplary damages, which again are the same thing as punitive damages. And the jury says, we're going to make an example of Bill because we don't want Warren going down this path and we don't want Mark Cuban going down this path. We don't want any of these multi-billionaires to go down this path. And so we want to make an example of Bill, a cautionary tale, if you will, so that these other people won't do that same behavior. 
And so you can see it's just a different way of looking at it. In punitive damages, we focus upon this particular defendant. Exemplary damages, we focus upon potential future defendants. Okay, so I've explained, so, so what are punitive damages, which we can also call exemplary damages? Well, they're damages that are awarded over and above compensatory damages because of the wanton, reckless, or malicious nature of the wrong done. Okay, now I spent a long time talking about punitive damages and exemplary damages, but the reality is they're not such a big deal, at least not in this course, because it's very, 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 very rare that a court will award punitive damages in a contract case. Um, I would say pretty much, you know, never. Uh, but they are an important cat category of damages in other types of cases, most notably tort cases. But this isn't torts, so um, it, 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 it isn't related to contracts per se, but since it's a type of damages in the textbook coverage, I wanted to cover that as well. Usually to have uh, punitive damages available, the conduct has to be intentional. I intended, in other words, Bill intended to punch the person in the nose. Um, and uh, that this action really violated the rights of the other person. Now many contract breaches are intentional. Um, going back to the example of Al, who was trying to decide, do I send my widgets to Mary or do I send my widgets to Bob? Well, that was an intentional decision. He was deciding who he was going to breach. He knew he had to breach one of them, but he was choosing which one. Pretty darn intentional. But even under those circumstances, um, uh, contract, dam contract uh, damages or, or punitive damages are not going to be awarded in a contract case. Um, so that's punitive damages. Let's talk about a third term for punitive damages, treble damages. Um, when I think treble, usually I think this, um, the treble clef, but we don't really mean that. We're not being musical here. We mean three, triple damages. So think three, think triplets. Treble is triple, is three, is not this. Okay, so treble damages are a form of punitive damages and they're authorized by statute. And again, it's three times. So let's say I have damages of a thousand dollars. Well, if I'm suing based upon a statute and I have met the qualifications for being able to collect treble damages, suddenly I now am going to get three thousand dollars as a result of this. So a pretty significant windfall for me. Most statutes that provide for tribal damages provide for it when the actual damages are pretty modest. The goal is to motivate plaintiffs to sue in those cases. I mean, let's face it, if I uh, was wronged by $50 or $100, the odds of me suing about it are pretty small. I mean, it's almost more of a hassle to sue than or more of a cost to sue than I'm going to recover. I have to be pretty darn worked up about it. But if we're looking at treble damages, uh, I have a little bit more skin in the game. I have a little bit more motivation to proceed in this area. So that's one of the big reasons that we see these statutes. The goal is to um, motivate plaintiffs when the damages are small to go ahead and uh, seek redress so that whatever that uh, defendant is who may have a history of engaging this behavior that he's going to get to be a little bit more responsible. Again this has relatively little applicability to contract law because these statutes aren't in the contracts. That, well I should say they're not. Uh, a, a big part, a, bi a common area for treble damages is going to be uh, the D T Deceptive Trade Practices Act, DDPA. Um, which does have to do Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act. I guess it's Dece Texas Deceptive Practices Act. No, I think there's a T there. DTPA, that's it. Okay. Um, and this has to do with uh, contracts many times, but there's also some level of, of fraud or other behavior. It's not a simple case of breach, but something else is going on, as you can see with the use of the word deceptive. 
again, beyond the scope of this course, we're not taught, this is not a DTPA course by any means. Okay, um, so I already mentioned the term torts. Torts are the things that we were talking about Bill doing, punching people in the nose. That would be a tort. Um, a car accident case is a tort. Um, what I just did to, to Bill is a tort, defame him. Obviously, Bill doesn't, as far as I know, doesn't go around punching people in the nose. Uh, so when I said that he did, I was defaming him. I was slandering him. Actually, it's not because you never believed me when I said that. But if you had believed me, that would be a tort against him. And so those are torts. Um, they, torts are different than contracts, obviously. So what is a tort? And this definition is awful. But um, it's a wrong involving a breach of duty and resulting in, a, in an injury, not a jury, but an injury to the person or property of another. Um, it's something other than a breach of contract. So now we have covered all of the types of legal contract remedies. So we've covered all of the legal remedies that we're going to cover here. These are the most important, and these two are instead. So we either go for nominal or we go for liquidated damages, or you probably go for some combination of these. And this one is almost never going to be available in a contract case. Next up, we will cover in our next presentation, equitable remedies. Again, we'll have six of those to cover. So. Uh, be on the lookout for the next video where we will cover equitable remedies available in breach of contract cases. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions about this material, please feel free to send me an email, come to my office hours, or raise, those, raise your questions in class. Hope you have a great day. Take care.